Hi, my name is Chris Osborne, and I appreciate the opportunity to serve as your mediator in an upcoming case. I have a presentation I'm going to walk through here because there are certain elements, descriptions, aspects of a mediation that I am required, to, and I want to make sure that I cover those all and also to make sure that you understand how we're going to proceed today and are comfortable with uh, the process. So I've got a presentation I call The Road to Resolution, and you all are, believe it or not, you're already on the road to resolution. If you have a dispute, then you are trying to get some resolution to it. And right now, you are engaged in the court process. And as you will find, of course, as your lawyers have been walking with you through so far, the court process, it's a long way from filing your lawsuit to actually getting to a trial. And there are lots of stops along the way. You may have done some of these stops already. You may still have some of these to come, but it begins with the pleadings and papers submitted to the court to make sure that the right claims are in the case, the right parties are in the case. Maybe uh, somebody's tried to dismiss part of the action. There's also the written discovery process, which you all may have engaged in so far. And that process involves making sure everybody has the information necessary, the documents, and knows the identity of the witnesses so that you can prepare for trial. And then you may have moved into a phase where depositions are being taken, where parties are giving their testimony under oath, and everybody's trying to get a preview of what the evidence is going to be at trial. And you might be taking depositions of other witnesses, people who heard what's going on. Today, we're here for a mediated settlement conference, and I'll explain all about that in just a moment. That's usually a way station along the way. It sometimes comes before there's a lot of discovery. It sometimes comes afterwards. It just depends on the party's readiness to discuss some kind of resolution. But if you keep on uh, pressing down the road to resolution towards a trial, then you might have some pretrial dispositive motions where a judge gets another chance to say certain claims are going forward, certain claims are not, certain parties might be uh, dismissed or let out on summary judgment, things like that. All things that I'm sure your lawyers have explained to you. And again, you may have experienced some of. As you get closer to trial, the preparation intensifies and there's more planning for the actual trial itself, exchanging exhibits and witness lists and things like that. And then if you do get to a trial, you have a judge and perhaps a jury who would render a decision on your case. You would present through your lawyers all the facts and all the evidence, and somebody makes a decision. And, and the main thing for you to think about for purposes of today is I'm sure your capable counsel will tell you that as good a trial lawyer as they may be, there's not one of them that has mind control power. There's not one of them that can guarantee a verdict will be rendered in your favor, no matter who you are, no matter which side of the case you're on. And if you have lawyers who are doing their job, I'm sure they've told you that. They can do their best and they can give you ideas of how likely you might be to prevail. But the bottom line is, at the end of the road to resolution, if you stay on the path all the way to a trial, other people will decide your case for you. And then if there's unhappiness with that, there's an appeal. And I have a little picture here that shows that's not even, you're not on the road anymore. You're just jumping off a cliff because if it, something gets to that level and there has to be appeals, it could be a long time before anybody knows who wins. And so today is a different kind of day. I highlight that to point out that the mediated supplement conference is a really different experience. It's supposed to be at least. Today is not a day for fighting out the battle of who's going to win, who's right, who caused the problem, who is dealing with it better than the other. Today is a day to put on a different hat, if you will, and to try to talk about, is there a way to work out this dispute? Is there a way to get off the road towards trial and get a resolution by a faster, more expedient, and maybe more cost-effective means? And so I'm going to talk just quickly about what I'm required to speak with you about, why we're here, what it's going to cost, how it works, what the process is. I'm going to make sure that we understand what the rules are regarding confidentiality, because there's often some confusion about that. And then when and how does this process end and what does that mean? So why are we here? Let me tell you very briefly first why I'm here. I got trained as a mediator in 2009 and I did it because by that point I'd been practicing law for about 14, 15 years and I had seen many cases resolve at mediation. I had seen mediation be effective for many of my clients at getting them off the road to trial, stopping the expenditure, stopping the stress and getting to a resolution that they weren't super thrilled with. It wasn't the ideal outcome, but it at least got them a measure of some relief. And the important thing for parties to remember at the stage of a mediation, if you're here, if you've got a lawyer engaged, if you are engaged in the litigation process, the ideal 
that you had in mind whenever you encountered somebody else and what you all hoped would come from that and everybody coming away happy and uh, thrilled with the outcome, that world is gone. If you've had to hire lawyers, if you've had to have this fight, then nobody is ending up happily where they're supposed to be. You're now trying to figure out how do we make the best of where we are and what are the options. And so what I love being able to do as a mediator is help that conversation happen. What are the options you have today? And one is, and always will be, to proceed to trial and have a judge hear your case and render a decision. But today is an opportunity for something different. I do this because I believe in mediation, having seen it as an advocate, I believe it now that I've been a mediator and I've seen cases where people came in, dug in, and no way in the world would it ever settle, and yet sometimes it does. And it's not any magical power that I have, it's simply the parties reach a point where they're ready to try to work something out and they see that as a better path than continuing to hack away at the case and hack away at each other. But the other thing I want to stress is I believe in mediation because I haven't experienced exactly what you have, but I have been a disputant. I have been a person in business and a friendship with other people where it blew up, it went south, it did not go well, and there was wreckage, there was damage, there were hurt feelings, there were monetary claims, and we benefited from having some neutral third party come in and help us have conversations. And the person that I needed to do this with was a, a longtime friend and a very sophisticated business person of themselves. And yet we couldn't get it fixed ourselves. We needed somebody to help us see what we couldn't see and hear what the other person was saying. So I believe in it as somebody who sat in the chair of needing this kind of help. And I hope you all will remember that as we keep going forward, that there's no shame in that. When you get into a dispute, people do all the time, but an outside voice can sometimes be helpful. So the opportunity today is for you all to see if you want to take control of the case, the parties to the case, not even the lawyers, but really the parties are the driving force on this day. And with the guidance of your counsel, we're going to explore whether you might be able to agree to a resolution. As a mediator, it's important for you to understand, I'm not a judge. I have no power. I make no decisions. I had a, a, a lawyer in a mediation I conducted last week say, you know, I've already told him, you have no horsepower. That's right. I have no horsepower and I'm not deciding anything. And so your lawyers don't have to persuade me of anything because I, I, I can't say who's right or wrong. and I'm not going to. What I'm here to do is listen to the story hear what happens between the parties and see if I can help the parties with the guidance of their counsel negotiate to an agreement they can live with. But I stress that there's no settlement. There's no resolution unless we have something that both parties agree on. I can't make anybody do anything. A lot of people think mediators twist arms. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't twist arms because I want people to only enter a resolution if they are voluntarily doing so. I may confront one side or the other, usually both, with some hard facts, trying to help them hear what the other side is saying and, and valid points the other side may have, especially if they haven't considered that before. But I don't make anybody do anything I can't. And so in this way, mediation is very different from trial. It's also different from other forms of alternative dispute resolution. I'm required to tell you about that as well. You may have heard the term arbitration, and a lot of people mix up the term arbitration a little bit with mediation and use them interchangeably, but they're not the same. Arbitration is out of court and it is private like this, as we'll talk about in a minute. But in arbitration, you're basically hiring a private judge. You're paying somebody who's a lawyer, who's well-trained, they might be a former judge, to actually do the job of a judge and or jury and render a decision. So it's less expensive than a trial in some ways. It's more expensive in other ways because you have to pay the arbitrator or arbitrators for their time. People do have more scheduling control in arbitration and you have to pay the arbitrator's fees. And but that's not what we're here. If you've thought that I'm making a decision or deciding anything, that's not right. That's arbitration. There's another new method of dispute resolution in North Carolina called collaborative law that is very similar to mediation in that it's out of court and it's private. And it is aimed at working towards a resolution. In a collaborative law situation, though, each party hires a specifically collaboratively trained lawyer uh, to try to work disputes out. And it's a fairly new form of dispute resolution and not a lot of people even know about it yet. So it's not that. You all have capable counsel and they will be your trial counsel if you go forward in this case. But today they're here to help you talk about is there a better path to resolution faster that you live with? And again, it's not their job to twist your arms or make you do anything. You parties today have the most control and the most say you'll ever have. 
Uh, the costs I'm required to go over, if I'm court appointed in this case, then that's not my hourly rate. It's a, a $150 an hour. And I will, of course, prepare an invoice at the end of our time. And that, that is split evenly. Now, the process, let me go over that briefly. We are in what's called an opening session right now. And in this opening session, the first and most uh, important thing that I have to do is go over the rules and go over the process, make sure everybody understands it. If you, again, had in mind that today your lawyers are going to square off and they're going to trade blows and fight with each other, I'd like to disabuse you of that notion because if we spend too much time doing that, it's not going to be helpful because everybody just gets jacked up and upset and more driven to try to just never mind, I'll go to trial. Today, we are going to hear about the case though, but I'd like to give you a different metaphor to think about as we discuss the case. I come in with basically this, a blank canvas. I don't know anything about this case. I have not researched the parties. I haven't researched the legal issues. I know zero. The lawyers are going to take an opportunity if they want to during this opening session. And what they're going to do is they're going to basically paint me a picture. I handle all kinds of mediations and some of them about real estate disputes, some are about employment disputes, but I know nothing typically coming in. And I ask each lawyer, the plaintiff typically goes first to basically paint me a picture. What happened? What uh, was the deal that brought people together? What was the incident that brought people together? And then how did it go wrong? And when the first party, the plaintiff usually is painting up there, the other side has to sit there and they're usually not going to like it. They don't like what that first attorney puts on the canvas. And I get that and that makes sense. And I may ask a few questions just to clarify and make sure I understand what they're telling me about the picture. When the other side gets to go, I don't want them to be an art critic and I don't want them to, to hack away at what the other party did. I want that lawyer to get out their colors and their paintbrush and paint me the rest of the story because there's always a second story. Never have I been so persuaded by the side that I hear that I just tune out and forget what the other side is because I've done this long enough to know there's always another side of the story. And by the end of that, it sounds like it's got some plausibility as well, nine times out of 10. And so at the end of this opening session, we're gonna have, I'll have a little bit better picture of what's going on as much or as little as your lawyers decide to tell me. And if uh, the parties want to speak, this is their opportunity to do go with whatever your counsel guides you on that. You don't have to. So at the end of this opening session, it's going to be a splotchy <clears throat> mess because it usually is. And the key is, remember, I'm not an art critic. I'm not here to say who's a better artist, which lawyer painted better. And I'm not a judge. I'm not going to say blue ribbon prize for this or anything like that. I am going to say, folks, this is the dispute that you have. This is the way it looks on paper. Now, what we may do from there then is because, again, I just have to have enough understanding to know how you got here and what the legal issues are in play. We'll then typically from there go into private sessions. And in this virtual environment, we would do that by means of breakout rooms. And so I've got everybody assigned to a breakout room that you will have the opportunity, parties and counsel to confer privately. And if nobody else, if you can't see anybody else in there with you, nobody else sees or hears what you're talking about. I will move back and forth from one room to the other, sharing thoughts and ideas and possibly proposals, offers, responses from the other side. The equivalent, if we were in my office or one of your offices, is we'd have everybody break into separate rooms and I would physically go back and forth between those rooms doing the same thing. In those caucuses, I'll hear more about the case. If there are things that you want to tell me about the case that you weren't necessarily comfortable or didn't want to say in the opening session, that's fine. But I'll be moving back and forth. And typically, you all wouldn't necessarily see each other again unless we have a deal at the end. Or sometimes I'll pull out the lawyers to have just a conference among lawyers to ask a sort of a strategic or legal question or something like that. It's not anything unusual for that to happen. And you'll know it's happening and they'll certainly tell you all about it. And so let me talk about confidentiality since I did mention that, uh, that you will be having private caucuses. Everything that happens during a mediation, the conduct of the parties and any statements made during a mediation is inadmissible at trial. What that mainly means is I can't be called as a witness to say what either party said or their lawyer said or did during a mediation session. And the purpose of that is to make sure that we can have a free discussion here, that folks can explore making offers of settlement to do something or to pay something or to let go of something that they might not do otherwise for the purposes of seeing does that get an agreement started and so generally speaking nobody can testify about our conversation here 
But that does not mean that everything that happens here is just completely secret and can never be ever uh, talked about. Just because you bring something up during a mediation doesn't mean it's off limits. If you tell me a fact, if that is otherwise discoverable through written discovery, through depositions, then it's still discoverable. You don't get any protection by talking about it here. And please bear that in mind. You do have the freedom to exchange offers of willingness to settle or willingness to compromise. And those are prohibited from ever being admitted in court under rule of evidence rule 408, which your lawyers have probably told you about. Now, so we gotta have then a ground rule that's very important here. And that is this, when we are in a private caucus and I'm talking with just one party and their lawyer, if you have a fact or a piece of information or a case or something that you do not want me to share with the other side, you need to designate that as such. I'm gonna presume that everything you tell me is something you want me to communicate in some fashion to the other side so they'll understand the basis for your offer, why your position is where it is, what your interests are, what you care. I'm gonna presume anything we talk about is fair game on the other side unless you or your lawyer mark it and say, hey, don't tell them this. And people do that sometimes and it's okay. And if it turns out that you say, here's a fact, don't tell them this, and we're getting later in the process, and I think it might be helpful for the other side to know that fact or know that piece of information, it might move them, we would have a conversation about that. And I would say, hey, what do you think about that, that thing you didn't want me to tell them? Or what do you think about that now, given where we are, would it be worth it or not? It's your decision. But again, presume that anything you tell me in our private caucus is fair game, unless you tell me otherwise, if that makes sense. Finally, when and how does this process end? If you all reach an agreement on all the material terms, then we would write up something. At a memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of settlement is the basic terms, and the parties would sign that, and the lawyers would then take some additional time to draft a more comprehensive settlement agreement and release of all claims that would contain all the moving parts and indicate who has to do what by when, and a lot of the details there. Sometimes I've had people in the course of mediation want to get the actual settlement agreement worked out. Sometimes they've been working on a settlement agreement before, or they've got one that's a really good fit and they just need to plug in some names. It just depends. And what I want you to understand though is at the end of it, if you have an agreement, we'll leave with something in writing so that it's enforceable. But we'll only get to that point if, again, both parties agree and say, yes, I recognize this is maybe not everything I would get, or this is more than I would uh, have to do or pay if I went to trial, but I'd like this outcome better, all things considered. If you don't get to an agreement, if we try and try for a while and it's just not happening, you're just, your uh, one side's position or what they want will never overlap with the others, then it's kind of, if y'all know the old singer Willie Nelson, you're on the road again. You're back on the road, litigation like nothing ever happened, and you go forward and complete the rest of your trial process. Now, you can come back to settlement discussions later. People often do, as your lawyers have probably told you. Most cases, the vast majority, tend to settle out of court, even if they don't settle at mediation. Lots of times the conversations we have on a day like this catalyze or, or prompt further discussions. And I've, I've got one from last week where after about seven days went by from the mediation, one party says, hey, can we get back into the conversation? We might be in a little bit different position now. And that's a great thing if that happens, if people want to keep exploring resolution after today. So it's not, hey, if you don't get it settled today, you'll never have the shot again. At the same time, this is the best day. This is the best shot and the most control, again, that you parties will have over this. But the only power that I really have, and it's not really much of a power, is to decide, have we hacked away at it long enough? Is it clear that there's no way these parties are gonna to get together today? In which case I can declare an impasse, or sometimes I will suspend a mediation if everybody's on board. We say, you know what? One side or the other isn't really ready but after maybe a couple more depositions or after some more time running some numbers, consulting uh, with somebody else or something, we'll, we will get back together. And sometimes we purposely plan to get back together. I am not a big fan of mediation going on deep into the night. I don't know how counsel on this uh, mediation feel about that. I'm not crazy about that just because I've had lots of people sort of express regret and say, oh, I was tired and it was too late. But that being said, I'll stay as long as it's productive and you all are willing to stay. And if we need to have some flexibility in that, again, that would be something we would all discuss and agree to. So that is an overview of how today is going to work.